welcome and thank you for being here. My name is Tyler Watson, Professor of Economics and Director of the Institute for Economic Education at East Texas Baptist University. And I'm going to talk today on the topic of curing poverty, what not to do. And I'm an economist, so of course I'm going to do some economics for you, complete with charts, graphs, jargon. Okay, get excited about that, right? <laughs> now I, I realize that when I say we're going to do some economics, that might be the least exciting six word sequence you'll hear today. The pure economics is uh, important, it's logically sound and valid, but it's also pretty dull and uninspiring. You know, nobody's ever marched for GDP growth or uh, rallied for equilibrium price, although those are two things that are actually very uh, near and dear to my heart. So, e the economics is important in helping us evaluate policies and programs aimed at reducing poverty, and that's what we're all here for, right? But we economists need to be humble, however, because economics cannot actually tell you specifically what to do to become rich. Getting rich is typically based on hard work, of course, but also involves a fair deal of guesswork, and good timing, luck even. Economics can, however, tell you the surefire ways to keep poor people poor. And I'll flip that around and say this. There's things that government policy should not do if you're looking to give people the maximum opportunity to escape poverty. So before we get to the pure economics, however, let me try to motivate our thinking on this by telling a true personal story. It's about a friend of mine, a guy I grew up with and I've known for a long time. He was from a tight-knit, loving family, and I, I still know and admire the family. Pretty solid people. But here's the thing. His dad was a criminal. Let me explain. He, he wasn't cruel or abusive, anything like that. He wasn't a thief. He didn't beat his kids. But he did routinely violate federal laws and regulations. You see, the dad was an entrepreneur, and he put my friend to work starting at age 10. I'm talking hard physical labor. They had a construction company. And the, the kids, he had a brother too. They did grunt work like digging, uh, mucking concrete, working around loud, dirty machines, kind of dangerous. So uh, strike one, this guy's dad was violating child labor law. Started the kid at age 10. It gets worse. The boy was paid a starting wage of $1 an hour at age 10. And this is at a time, I looked this up the other day, the federal minimum wage was $4.25. So he's earning about one-fourth of federal minimum. Strike two, violating minimum wage law. Oh yeah, and lest I forget, he was a tax cheat. He didn't withhold the social security tax from the kid's paycheck either. I don't know if it was just that kid or the other workers. Yeah, that's strike three. So this kid's dad, an apparently decent guy, mind you, he, he coached youth football. He was a really friendly neighbor. He, was, he taught Sunday school. He was a three-fold violator of federal labor and tax law. Oh, and, and one more thing. Uh, I found out later on, the guy, the dad, that is, he was also hiring un undocumented immigrants, so violating yet another branch of uh, labor law. So what do you think about this guy? Not, not the kid so much, but the dad. Multiple federal lawbreaker who arguably exploited child and illegal immigrant labor. Well, I'll tell you what the kids thought about him, because I still know them, and uh, we occasionally talk, and we, we talk about the guy, the, old, the, uh, the dad. There were two sons and a daughter in this family. The sons both grew up working in the family business. Uh, one of them actually still works with the dad. They still do construction, they build houses. The daughter worked only a little tiny bit in the family business, but she's still close with the dad too. In fact, all three of the kids, now grown, deeply love, admire, and respect their dad, always have. You might be asking, how do I know these intimate details about this family? Okay, as you might have guessed by now, I'm the boy, okay? Forgive me if that seemed deceptive. You know, I really do know him well and his family, uh, and the story is entirely true. Okay. So you might be wondering, what's my point in telling you all of this? Calling out my own dear old dad as a criminal. And, and I don't view him that way. I'm just I'm using that to kind of challenge our thinking. What some would view as criminal, though, as exploitation, as cheating, was, in my view, actually one of the greatest gifts uh, a parent or an adult could give to a child. My parents bestowed on me a great privilege in this way. And it has nothing to do with race, class, or sex. You know, we hear talk about white privilege. But in my case, it was work privilege. I was richly blessed to grow up under loving, caring parents who taught me two essential things. One is Christianity. The fact that I have life, forgiveness, and salvation in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And thus I can live without fear of death or any kind of malady. And the second is work, that I never need worry about my family's daily bread 
because I gained both trade skills, I learned how to do construction work, it allowed me to do any, basically any kind of construction job. But more importantly, I learned what I call economic skills that have allowed me to, to get a job. And there's more to work than just the job, just having the job, there's knowing how to acquire the job, and I think that's the more important thing. So my parents taught me how to work and how to get work, and I've never been unemployed because of that. And I'm not, I don't want to brag, I don't want to seem too uh, egotistical about this, uh, but it does illustrate the tremendous benefit of those skills and work knowledge that mom and dad taught me from a very young age. Knowing both how to work and how to get work has meant that I've never wanted for a job and I've never lacked income. And uh, just a few years into my work life, re recall starting at age 10, working in the summer, I had all already developed some skill. So by the age 15, I was pouring concrete, driving excavators, putting up drywall, putting down roofing, running, my, I ran my own lawn mowing business when I wasn't do, on the weekends, um, when I wasn't doing construction. Every summer, thinking back, it was probably 50 to 60 hours. We would work long days, you know, take advantage of the daylight on those job sites. And that was while school was in session. I would earn, uh, work an occasional weekend here and there too when dad needed extra help. So the point is by age 18, I was earning somewhere around $12 an hour. And minimum wage at that time was, I think, uh, five, I wanna say 515, well more than double minimum wage. So starting out well below minimum wage allowed me to bypass by in a few years minimum wage. My buddies were trying to get their first jobs when they were, we were 17, 18 years old. They were struggling to find minimum wage jobs. I was earning more than double minimum wage, had all the work I could, I could want. So looking back, I'm convinced that the skills and mentality I had attained by age 18 set me on the path of success for the rest of my life. These skills carried me through college and graduate school, both in the sense that I could earn an income while I was in uh, school and support my family. By the time I was in grad school, uh, my wife and I had been married. We had two kids. And also helped me pass my classes in the sense that doing work from an early age, and construction work in particular, gave me a project-oriented mindset. So I could uh, you know, think about a project, the goal of the project, the steps necessary to take it, and then perform those steps diligently one by one whether that be building a bathroom from scratch. I, I remodeled people's houses in grad school. I did a lot of handyman work. Or you know, writing a research paper. Different skills, but the same kind of basic underlying process of planning and step-by-step -step progress towards a, a complex um, goal. And as I mentioned, towards the end of my graduate school career, I was married with two young kids. I was commuting 50 miles each way to work did handyman work by day to school, classes by night. I worked from 20 to 30 hours a week doing that, all around the Washington DC area, so I had to contend with the traffic too, high cost of living. It was a struggle, you know? And I haven't looked this up, but uh, I, I might go back and look at our tax returns. We were, I bet, pretty close to the poverty level. But I never bothered to check and think about that. The word poor just wasn't in our vocabulary. We always had work, therefore we had sufficient income to meet our needs, even though they were lean times, you know? God provided for us and we did just fine. Again, my point here is not to brag, and I don't really want to make it about me. I'm not special, I just know my story better than anyone else's. But uh, I'm just blessed and privileged with this opportunity to start very young and acquire these work skills. And I think my, my story is actually not all that rare. It just happens to be the one I know best. The point is that there's a simple cure to poverty, work. Simple, not necessarily easy. It can be very challenging to acquire that, but it's but it's simple. And I happen to be really good at work because of the work privilege my parents bestowed on me from a young age. Because mom and dad loved me enough to break barriers, including what we would have considered stupid or inefficient laws, in order to teach me how to work and how to find work. Okay, Let me say that again so it really sinks in. Mom and dad loved me enough that they exploited my child labor and violated federal laws in order to teach me about work. And I should note, in fairness to dad, that he actually only broke two laws. I later learned that the minimum work age, the 14-year-old work age, doesn't apply in a family business. So he was only breaking the minimum wage and tax withholding. And uh, 
maybe I, I shouldn't say anything more about that and shouldn't tell you where he lives now, but uh, I think he'll be fine. You know, and on that, on that point of it's not, it's okay to hire your own kids below age 14. It's okay with the government to provide work privilege for your own kids. But you want to help someone else's kids get a really early start on learning how to work? No, nah, that's forbidden. You know, good. My view is that I'm really glad the government wasn't protecting me from that kind of exploitation. Okay, so let me let me recap, and I'll, I'll move to my slides now because we're about to get into the pure econ, and I have to have chart. So here's just a recap of my story. Never been poor or unemployed due to the work privilege that I was blessed with by mom and dad from a very young age. Simple cure to poverty is work. Simple, remember, but not easy. It's, it can be a, a challenge, and that's why I'm a big fan of starting very, very young and having, and having kids start working. And work is not the same as, as a job, mind you. Work is a life skill, and the younger you can start at it, the better you get at it, the better you become. And I think that's, what my, that's the main lesson of my story. And I was extremely privileged to be able to start at an extremely young age. Other kids might start at slightly older ages, but I think the general principle is the younger you can start, the better you get at both particular skills for particular kinds of jobs, but also just the generalized skill of knowing how to go and find work and talk to people and, and land jobs and keep yourself employed and producing and earning. And people who get on this path, they will not encounter poverty. Okay, so now to the economics. And the, the title of my talk is What Not to Do if you want to give people the best chance of escaping poverty. Not necessarily becoming rich, because like I said, there's a lot of luck and timing and other factors involved in that. But we can't say that we can prevent people from being poor. We can try to help prevent people from being poor. And here's, here's the basic recommendation. Do not have government policies that impair or destroy people's ability to work. Especially, don't cut off young people's work opportunities their access to those early jobs that build the work privilege that will carry them through productive, employed, non-poor lives. So what government policies might we be talking about here? Well, going back to my story, these were the ones that I was fortunate enough to have been able to sidestep or escape because mom and dad didn't, you know, didn't care so much about complying with laws. They cared more about putting us to work and giving us opportunities. Okay, so we'll get to the economics now. Don't have government policies that impair or destroy people's ability to work, especially young people. What kind of policies might we be talking about here? Uh, there, there's actually many, unfortunately, but I'll focus on three big ones that, in my professional opinion, represents some of the biggest obstacles to work currently faced by the poor and uh, youth in America in particular. And those are minimum wage, occupational licensing laws, and the payroll tax, and I'll address each one of these in turn. I'll probably spend a little bit more time on minimum wage because I think that is the biggest uh, obstacle and the biggest danger because we have a large popular movement wanting to not only maintain a minimum wage but actually to increase it dramatically. This could have potentially devastating consequences on employment opportunities for uh, poor and youth in particular. So let's tackle the minimum wage. I, it's a tragedy, I'll say starting off, it's a tragedy that the people most supportive of minimum wage increases are those who are most likely to be harmed by the presence of a minimum wage to begin with, the, the poor. Okay, and let me explain. Pure economics teaches that there's one thing that determines a person's wage, is marginal value product. There's some econ jargon for you, you know, write that one down. I tell my students, uh, say it to your parents, it sounds smart. What does that mean? In simple terms, we're just talking about the value of what a worker produces. What, what an individual worker's contribution to the, to the income, the revenue of the business is. You're not gonna get more than that. Actually, you're not gonna probably get much less than that either because labor markets are competitive. So if a worker is really valuable in contributing and being underpaid by a particular company, that worker, the company will either realize, hey, we need to raise that person's pay or he or she, he or she will leave, or the worker will realize, I bet I could make more elsewhere, the worker will leave. That happens all the time. I think, and business owners can attest to this, you know, they know that they will lose money if they overpay their workers, but they also know that they'll lose the worker if they underpay the worker. So they've got to get it right on the money, so to speak. And people with lots of work experience, which I imagine is most of us here, we probably understand this as well, 
we've seen our earnings go up over time as we get better at the job, gain skills, gain experience, maybe some you know, extra education, you see the earnings go up. And if it might not be, again, from one particular business, they don't recognize your skills, you'll jump ship, you'll leave. It's a competitive economy. It's a highly mobile, mobile labor market. And that's good because that ensures that people get paid their marginal value product, or in other words, they get paid what they contribute. Okay, now, some people think entrepreneurs are hoarding piles of money Scrooge McDuck style, and it's only stinginess that prevents them from sharing more of the wealth with the workers. The, the fact is that businesses only hire people when doing so contributes, contributes to the bottom line, adds profits. That means they pay people roughly what they're worth in terms of the value of their contribution. So what does that mean for minimum wage? If a person's work value happens to be low, the minimum wage might wind up cutting off all legal work opportunities. And why would workers, why would a worker's value of contribution be low, lower than minimum wage? Well, it's just the mere fact that that worker doesn't have much skills yet that makes them productive. Yeah, you know, it's typically the youth. They can gain skills, but how do you gain skills? You gain skills on the job or through education. Now, we're talking in many cases when we're looking at the poor of people who lack educational opportunities for whatever reason. Okay? And should we expand educational opportunities if it's realistic to do so? Absolutely. But you know, setting that aside, just given the situation that people are in now, and we're talking about what the minimum wage does, well, it might shut off the, the possibility of getting that first job, that early job that builds what I refer to as the work privilege that can set you on a trajectory. And remember, the main point of my story is that I was extremely blessed and extremely privileged to start very young, very, very young, and therefore attained an enormous amount of that work privilege. So when we talk about unskilled workers, it's, it's not a slight against them. It's just a fact, and it's typically just a correlation with youth and inexperience and low education level. So let's go to the diagrams now, and I'll, I'll walk you through. And you might be familiar with the supply and demand diagram. The way we think about a minimum wage is a price floor on unskilled labor. And, and when I talk about this with my college students, I'll tell them, you know, the minimum wage is irrelevant for, for the college students. Well, the college graduates, I should say. Because their first jobs, if, once they graduate and they have a, a credential that kind of signals to employers that, that they are more reliable, high productivity workers, they're going to start at at least $20 an hour. So they have, to, they have just uh, leapfrogged past the minimum wage. It's totally unbinding. It's totally irrelevant for them. And as I mentioned, it was irrelevant for me by the time I even, even by the time I reached legal working age, you know, when I was 15 years old and was doing uh, concrete labor work, I was earning more than minimum wage at that time. Back to the minimum wage, the people it really hurts are those who are not blessed with that ability or opportunity to complete college or start work early. And this is often the poor, whom the advocates of the minimum wage, ironically, are trying to help. And I, I don't uh, doubt their sincerity. What I do doubt is their understanding of the economics of this. Here's what this kind of price floor does in a market. It causes more sellers. In, in a labor market, the sellers are workers, prospective workers, than buyers, the employers. A result which we call a surplus. Let me put this into motion. So very low skill workers, very young workers, might have a true market value of, let's say, $5 an hour. What the minimum wage does is forces them to charge a higher price, $7.25. So we have a price above equilibrium. What's happening here? More people are trying to work. We have a quantity supplied up here greater than the quantity demanded, which is the number of uh, workers that businesses are willing to hire at that price. As wages go up, businesses cut back on their hiring level for obvious reasons. You know, one thing that we're really going to see with this, especially if we get these proposed minimum wage increases come through, is a further movement towards replacing labor with capital. You're going to see uh, minimum wage type jobs uh, be eliminated in favor of uh, machines and technology that can do that work probably, uh, in many cases, more efficiently. So we have a special term for this when <coughs> quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded. That's called a small market surplus. That, that gap between quantity people are trying to sell and the quantity people are willing to buy, that's a surplus. And these terms here, consumer producer surplus, these refer to the gains for individual buyers and sellers. Those also get eroded. 
Now, some workers, remember, workers are the producers here. Some workers will see higher pay, and they'll be uh, happy about it. But other workers, prospective workers, will see the jobs disappear because businesses can't, can no longer afford to hire as many people. And this purple area here represents the vanished gains that those workers and, and the businesses would have had. We call that dead weight loss. It's a dead weight loss because it's a loss that didn't need to happen. It's strictly a policy-induced loss. Gains we could have had. People working the extra jobs and, and businesses having the extra workers, we could have had that. But because of a, a foolish policy, we don't. Okay, now let me, that, there's the economic theory. There, there's the pure economics. Let me try to offer some, some evidence or demonstration of this. When you compare the teen unemployment rate to the overall unemployment rate, you'll notice that teens, there it is, teens are consistently unemployed at a rate three to four times higher than everyone else. Currently, overall unemployment is 5%, and we consider that, that's pretty much on target of where we would want it to be. We call that the natural rate. That's pretty much where most economists say we can't get much lower than that. And by reference, remember it hit 10.3% in early 09 in the depths of a pretty big recession that we went through then. So 5% is pretty good, it's pretty on target. The teen unemployment rate is three times that. And that's a pretty chronic and consistent trend. So the red line here, we're going back to 05 or so. The red line here is the overall unemployment rate for everybody. It starts at five. When times are good, it jumps to 10 during the recession, comes down gradually, and we're back to five. But notice that teen unemployment, and this is only 16 to 19 year olds. So this actually doesn't capture necessarily even everybody who's affected by minimum wage, but it captures one of the core groups that is affected by minimum wage. Is that taking into account teens that are not seeking employment? Or? No, the, anyone who's not seeking unemployment is not in the labor force, so they don't count in any unemployment okay. data. And that's something else to consider if we think about teens that maybe have given up on the job search because they find a lack of jobs, partly because of minimum wage, that would make that uh, even higher. So what we'd want to look at there is the teen labor force participation rate. And that's, uh, that, that would be good, like the next step to look at. I don't have, happen to have that handy. But I think this is pretty compelling in and of itself, the fact that that teen rate is always higher. It's not just because of recession. Notice that in this gray period here highlights the, the official recession era from actually December 07 into, I think it was uh, second quarter 09. Okay. That drives all the unemployment rates up, of course. So that's the cyclical component. But this consistent gap here, that is what we would call the structural component due to policies, mainly minimum wage, that are hindering these people's ability to even get jobs to begin with. Okay, so let me, let's sum up and then we'll move on and talk about the other two things. What not to do to alleviate poverty. Number one, do not enact a minimum wage. Okay, now let's take on the occupational licensing laws. And I have a, a brief video here that's very illustrative of this, but I'll, I'll say a little bit first. We're talking about license requirements for the kind of jobs that ordinary enterprising people, including the poor, would be able to do with little or no training or with training and skills that they maybe already have or they can kind of acquire on their own. They learn these kind of things on their own. They can start up a business if they want to without the need for expensive or lengthy formal schooling. And simply put, what governmental licensing requirements do is put up barriers to these people starting businesses and, and attaining their own employment. And those barriers are often very costly to jobs that they can and should be able to do already. And the video segment here that we'll watch from, by journalist John Stossel, and also in, including my pro former professor, uh, Dr. Walter Williams at George Mason University, tells a depressingly common tale of how licensing laws seek to crush the entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> woman who's good at braiding hair. Ten years ago, she moved from Africa to Utah. She assumed she could support her two kids by using the hair braiding skills she learned in Africa. And she did for four years. Did this in her home and made decent money. But then the government shut her down because, as this video from the Institute for Justice explains, she didn't have an expensive and useless cosmetology license. That license requires at least 2,000 hours of classroom instruction. That's 40 hours a week for 50 weeks. 
That is more class hours than it takes to be an armed security guard, mortgage loan originator, real estate sales agent, EMT, and lawyer combined. And not one of those 2,000 hours teaches African hair braiding. Hair braider Justina Clayton joins us now from Utah, along with Paul Avalar, her lawyer from the Institute for Justice, which took her case for free. Paul, the license costs thousands of dollars for a class that's useless, really? That's correct. Uh, in all those 2,000 hours, they don't spend any time teaching you how to braid. So why do they pass a rule like that? Well, what happened was the state just passed a really broad law and left it to the, the cosmetology board to, to, to interpret it and enforce it. And the cosmetology board is made up entirely of cosmetologists who don't like competition. So they get to work with government to keep competition out. And Justina, you, you were doing this for four years, and then you think another a competitor complained? Yes, I actually got an email. Um, the email threatened to um, report me to the licensing division if I continue to braid. But you'd already and gone so, to the licensing commission and they said, oh, hair braiding is okay. Yes, so the cosmetology lady told me that the situation had changed and that I needed to go to school now and get a license. Maybe the situation so, changed because your competitors complained. And the school really doesn't teach hair braiding, but you'd have to go anyway? Yes. I called about six schools um, along the West Side Front, and they um, told me that they don't teach braiding and that I needed to, if I want to specialize in braiding, I would have to get independent help with that. So they also told you if you want to work, you have to go to the legislature and get them to pass a law to allow you to do this. And you started yes. to do that. Yes. They told you that if you kept braiding, went back into business, you'd be fined 2000 bucks a day? Well, the first offense is $1,000. The oh, second offense and any subsequent offense is $2,000. So Each day. Paul, I mean, this is nuts, and this is not unique to Utah, right? It is not unique to Utah. There are about 10 states that require, explicitly require people to go get this expensive, useless license to braid hair. Um, and about half of the states don't have a rule. They, like Utah, just leave it to the cosmetologist to decide whether or not they want to be competed with. And states always create these licensing board and boards, and licensing sounds good to people. They don't realize they get captured by the established business. Absolutely. And when we called them, they said, we don't make the laws, we just enforce them. <laughs> um, but you've gotten these laws overturned. You're seven for seven at the Institute for Justice. That's right. We've They're sued. not overturned, but they give up when you that's, call. Yeah, that's right. In seven states, we've sued about this very same issue. Uh, California fought us, and we beat them in court, and every other state and the District of Columbia has just given up the fight. And Justina, one, one of the people, one of the cosmetologists said, if you don't get a license and you don't go to school braiding people's hair, you might make them bald. <laughs> um, no, braiding, braiding is, you know, completely safe. It is reversible. So, so no, it doesn't hurt. It's not harmful. But the government wants to stop you. And it used to be that one in 20 yes. workers needed government permission to do their occupation. Today, it's one in three. They keep passing more of these rules. That's right. And occupational licensing laws fall hardest on minorities, on poor, on elderly workers who want to start a new career or change careers. They, they just help entrenched industries and businesses keep out competition. Outside this studio, just out there, are 10,000 yellow taxis. And it's intuitive to think that government should license those cabs, make sure they're safe, make sure the drivers are competent, limit the number of them so you don't have chaos out there. And they do license taxis here in New York. They license them to death. You can't just buy a cab and start picking up passengers. You have to buy a license from another cab company, and that now costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Regulation itself has priced poor people out of the taxi business. I drove a cab back in 1957 for a while. I made about $125 a week. The drivers in Philly now tell me they make about $250 a week. They could make much more if they owned their own cabs. But what stops them? It's the thousands of federal and state regulations that are imposed on the U.S. economy. Sometimes getting a license requires a friend in the business. All those licensing laws do just one thing, keep outsiders out.
I mean, I can see when a medallion in New York now costs six hundred thousand dollars, it keeps poor people out. But are you saying just have no licensing? Let anybody hang out a shingle, just go by, offer to pick people up? That well, it, well, people. well, compare New York City, uh, where a license to own and operate a taxi is six hundred three thousand dollars as of last year. Well, uh, there are not many black-owned taxis in New York City. You go to Washington D.C. And you see, most of the taxis are owned by blacks. And so can you say, oh, well, there's Washington, D.C. is just a wonderful city for blacks. No, it takes $200 in order to get a license to own and operate one taxi. And that makes the difference. The unintended consequences of well-intended regulation hurting the people that the politicians claim to be helping. I don't think that they're unintended. That is... What, what incumbents want to do, they want to keep outsiders out so they can charge higher prices and they make payoffs to politicians to keep the system in order. In some places, poor people do have the opportunity to go into the, the taxi business through Uber. Anybody in here taking an Uber? I just took my second Uber trip ever in uh, uh, Dallas airport area. And, you know, I always like to talk to the drivers and say, how long have you been doing this? How much money do you make? It's a great opportunity for poor people because all you need is a car. It's got to be a relatively new car. It doesn't have to be brand new. It doesn't have to be a high-end car. You know, the last time I got picked up in a Kia, Hyundai. It's a Hyundai, you know, so it can be a low-end car. All you need is a car and a clean driving record, and bam, you can go start working and picking up a lot of extra income, supplemental income. And that's a great opportunity for poor people to, to get some income and, and to go out and serve people. Of course, unless you're Austin, right? Anybody familiar with what happened to Uber there? No. Austin has banned Uber. Why? It's the same story that uh, my former professor there, Dr. Williams, is telling. Um, the license or whatever because they keep the outsiders out. Yeah, exactly. The, the insiders pay more money just so they can keep their occupation going. Bingo. The licensed yellow cab drivers successfully uh, lobbied the city council there to outlaw Uber. So what's hap what happens to the cab fares? What happens to the ability to people easily enter that industry? Right? It shuts off work opportunities. And there's a lot of little examples like this, whether it's the hair braiding, or whether people want to set up pet grooming, or whether people want to start a jitney or cab type service. There's all these little impediments that are hard to notice in the aggregate, but they're out there. And they're keeping poor people from starting up businesses and, and jobs that they could do right now. Okay? We're not necessarily talking about medical licensing. You know, Poor people aren't thinking about opening up a uh, neurosurgery shop necessarily. But uh, driving, or dog grooming, or hair braiding, all these little services that everybody needs, it's really a vibrant, entrepreneurial opportunity for them are oftentimes shut down. So this leads me to uh, rule number two or item number two for what not to do to alleviate poverty. Do not enact occupational licensing requirements on any jobs that the poor could otherwise do now. Okay, and finally we'll tackle what I think is one of the most insidious anti-work poverty inducing government policies of them all, the payroll tax. And economists like to say if you tax something you get less of it. Payroll tax is pure and simple, a job tax. It's a, it's a first dollar tax on anyone with a job. There's no exemptions or deductions for people with low income, children, mortgage payments, et cetera, like there are with the personal income tax. Okay. Now, of course, the government needs revenue to do its jobs, providing public goods, law and order. I'm not against taxation per se. I'm not against having a government. We need a sound government. We need a, a legal system. We need the police to have the underlying institutions for markets. Okay. So it's not about revenue, it's not about taxation per se, it's about the incentive effects. And economists, for this reason, favor a tax system to be neutral. We want taxes to be neutral in terms of altering people's incentives to work, to save, to consume. We want just pure economic forces driving those incentives. However, the American people have consistently shown a preference for a progressive income tax system. And that's the single largest source of tax revenue for the federal government currently. And what does progressive taxation mean? I'm, I imagine you're familiar with the term. It means that those with higher incomes pay a higher share of the total tax burden, and I have some data on that. This is the current rate structure. So as your income goes up, your tax rate goes up on the marginal income. So you're taxed at a higher rate on higher 
uh, segments, increments of your income. And that's actually very friendly to, to the poor, regardless of your views on uh, progressivity, regardless of your particular preferences. This is very friendly towards the poor in terms of not taxing away income into so much until you reach a certain threshold. And of course, there's a lot of uh, exemptions, deductions, tax credits. The earned income tax credit is actually a very pro-work, pro-poor policy. And if you ask economists, what should we do? We hate the minimum wage. So what should we do to help the poor expand the EITC or enact wage subsidies? I'm convinced that it's really just a matter of marketing. People can sink their teeth into the idea of $15 an hour minimum wage because they say, yeah, that would double my paycheck. And imagine how much better it would be without realizing the unintended side effects of the labor surplus, the unemployment, the shutting off job opportunities. When we talk about expand EITC, what the heck is that? ET, phone home, you know, EITC? Anybody know what that is? I ask my students, they never, they never know. Earned income tax credit, yeah. How does it work? It's a tax credit for earned income. So if you have some income, the government gives you money back. You don't actually pay taxes, the government gives you a check. It's not welfare because you have to be working in order to qualify for it. So it's actually really, uh, it's really one of the best economic ways to provide income support to the poor. You have to have a job to get it. So you're getting work experience, you're building up work privilege, and then the government says, we'll supplement you. Now, actually, ironically, the fact that EITC benefits disappear at a certain income threshold, and then you start paying higher marginal tax rates means that when we have the EITC in place, we have actually a pretty steep tax, marginal tax cliff once you cross a certain income threshold, but that's kind of a separate issue. So I'm throwing that in there because Oftentimes, we economists seem kind of cold and cruel. Well, you don't want the government to do anything to help the poor. Well, there's some things that are economically very sens sensible. EITC is one of them. You don't see people rallying for EITC, but I'm suggesting maybe we should. And the minimum wage is very foolish in terms of eliminating job opportunities. Let's go back. Let's talk more about progressivity for just a minute. This is from 2014. This is the latest uh, numbers I could find. And this is the distribution of personal income tax down by income quintile. You see the bottom fifth of earners up to 24,000 annual income. They actually, we're getting in, they weren't paying taxes probably through earned income tax credit and other credits that were getting money back from the treasury. So there, there's no income burden, income tax burden on the poor, the personal income tax. It's, it's highly concentrated on the top quintile. People earning above 30, 134,000 are paying 84%. And then if we zoom in on that top quintile, you see it's even kind of even more disproportionately it's, uh, rests upon the, the really high earners. So the, the top 5%, the, the 90 to 95th percentiles here, they're paying 10%, uh, 9% of all the income tax. The, the next four percentile is paying 20, 18%. The top 1% is paying 46% of all personal income tax. Now, I just put that out there by way of having people informed. We could have different preferences about whether that's right or whether that burden should be increased, reduced. I'm not here to really discuss that. That's a matter for our, our political preferences. My point is just that the personal income tax is progressive. It, it disproportionately burdens the high income, and it's actually no burden at all on the low income. And if we want to help the poor in terms of encouraging work, and encouraging hiring, that's the way you want your tax system structured. You tax something, you get less of it. What happens then when you tax first dollar income of everybody, and that's what the payroll tax does, including the lowest income people in society? Well, arguably, you get less jobs, less work being done. And the payroll tax system, and when we say payroll tax, we're talking about Social Security and Medicare, the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. That's the law that enacted the Social Security payroll tax. Yeah, so the federal income tax, if you're below a certain income threshold, you know, you might get all of that back based on whatever bracket you're in. But that payroll tax, you know, if you're down here and you've got a lot of exemptions, you'll get a big tax refund on the federal income tax component. But if you're uh, at, at any income level, you don't get this back. Okay. That's, that's going to pay grandma and grandpa's Social Security checks, but that's, that's another issue as well. Uh, the point of all this is that the, this check is steep, this tax is steeply re regressive. It poses a heavier burden on those with lower incomes, and this chart demonstrates that. This came from the Tax Policy Center. 
They're probably more of a left, left to center group, but they provide really good data and research on these things. Uh, we can see the effect of federal tax rates for households in the lowest income quintile in 79 through 2011. And notice that the individual income tax, the bottom line here in dark blue, it's actually negative. It poses a net benefit for them in terms of receiving the credits, like the EITC, the per child credit, and so on. So that's actually no burden at all. It's a slight benefit for low income households. And notice that payroll taxes is the only thing that's a significant burden for them. And it's, it's been rising steadily as the uh, personal income tax burden has been falling out. Fortunately, in the grand scheme of things, the individual income tax the tax benefits. The income tax benefits offset the payroll tax burden, but the payroll tax is still a burden for them. It's a tax on first dollar. It's a regressive. That's the main thing I want you to remember. It's a regressive tax. It hits everybody and the poor at a disproportionate burden. Now, personally, I'm opposed as a matter of principle to progressive taxation, but that's just my personal preference. That's not economics. That's just personal preference. But I'm, I'm vehemently opposed to regressive taxation. I'd rather have some progressive taxation than to have any regressive taxation because regressive taxation is anti-work. It, it knocks down poor people's ability to get those first jobs and build the work privilege. The poor can least afford the taxes that quite possibly tax them out of the jobs that they desperately need. And I have a sense that that's what the payroll tax does more than any other tax. And the, the debate on the proper level of payroll taxes or whether payroll taxes should be done away with is complicated by the fact that uh, these FICA taxes fund Social Security, or, or the idea at least, the claim that FICA funds Social Security. So a lot of people get, uh, get kind of sidetracked into ideas of, of the Social Security lockbox and trust fund. But pure economics indicates that regressive first dollar tax on wage earners is bad for wage earners, especially those at the bottom of the wage distribution. So this, is, this leads me to my final do not. What not to do to alleviate poverty number three, do not regressively tax the very thing that we've identified as secure for poverty, work. And that's what payroll tax does. So I hope I've helped you think about the damage that bad government policies can do in the effort to uplift the poor. And in my book, Nothing Works Like Work, as I've said, and I would suggest that my deep work privilege makes me a living example of that. Can government promote work? I'm skeptical of that. I think it starts in the home, in the local community. And so many government policies, like minimum wage, occupational licensing, and, and payroll taxes are clearly anti-work, especially for the poorest among us. A work privilege starts at home. I think my ex and my experience demonstrates that and, and convinces me that civic efforts towards strengthening traditional family values are really the best way to promote work. If more people could have the privileges I had, being able to work in a family business environment, I think that would be tremendously beneficial in building up work ethic. Government policies can, however, and do get in the way of poor people's ability to either get work or to benefit from the work they have. So again, policies like minimum wages, occupational licensing, and the payroll tax are the wrong things to do if we want to help the poor. As a doctor of economics, my prescription is to drop these bad habits and restore healthy labor markets that all people at all levels of society can take advantage of. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions and comments.